thanks so much for that generous introduction and for the opportunity to come talk with you all about some of my favorite research projects and the lessons that I hope that they can bring to people who are in the tough position of having to make actual policy decisions, which no one ever entrusts economists to do. So this is a great chance for me to talk with you, and I'll look forward to any questions that you have. And please um, stop me if I'm being unclear, but there'll be time for questions at the end. My goal is to tell you about a body of research that I hope brings you some hard evidence on both the costs and the benefits of expanding Medicaid. And sorry, you can't hear me. They can't hear me. You need me to stand here. Can you hear me now? This is going to be like the hardest part of the talk is to stand right here. So please flag for me if I am not audible. And I'll just gesture more wildly from this position. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, I'm going to hopefully bring you some information about the real costs and benefits of expanding Medicaid. And you would think that this is a question people have already figured out the answer to. Medicaid has been around for 50 years. This is not a new program. What this billions of dollars that is being spent on ensuring low-income and disabled Americans is actually doing to their health and overall health care spending is a first-order question. And academic researchers should have produced an answer to this set of questions for you already. But it's harder than it sounds. You'd think it would be pretty easy. Look at people who are on Medicaid, see how much health care they use, see what their health outcomes are. Look at people who are not on Medicaid, see how much health care they use and what their health outcomes are, and compare them. And you can say, well, that's the effect of the program. It's not so easy, though. People who are on Medicaid are really different from people who aren't on Medicaid in lots of other ways. How do you get on Medicaid? You get on Medicaid by being poor. You get on Medicaid by having a disabling health condition. You get on Medicaid because when it's available, you bother to fill out the paperwork and get yourself signed up for the program. Now I'm very loud. <laughs> the type of people who end up on the program look very different from the type of people who aren't on the program. So if you just compare their health outcomes, you'll get a really mistaken idea of what the program itself is doing. And that's the reason I think we saw such very disparate claims about what the program was doing. People would say that Medicaid's worse than being uninsured because people on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate than the uninsured. Is that because of Medicaid or is it because they are poor and in worse health to begin with? People would say expanding Medicaid not only improves health, it saves money. We're going to get people out of the emergency department and it's actually going to improve our finances as well as people's health. Is that true? Will people really stop using the emergency department? It's very hard to know the answer to that question if you don't have a good comparison group. And what we were able to do through a unique set of circumstances in Oregon is give you evidence that's based on a randomized controlled trial. That is a geeky technical scientific term, but it's very important to me. So I want to tell you a couple sentences about why I think that's so important for the evidence. You would never trust a drug trial that compared the effects of taking a drug to no control group. Imagine an allergy medication where you, know, you give patients who are sneezing the allergy medication, you wait six months and measure again in January and they're not sneezing anymore. And you say, therefore, my allergy medication works. Any rational observer of that study would say, well, did the pollen count change? What happened? What would have happened if you didn't give people the medication? And that's why we require randomly assigned control groups for things like drugs, medical devices, lots of things in the healthcare system. But you almost never have a control group like that available for public policy questions. And there are good reasons for that. If you want to know what investment in early childhood education does to lifetime earnings, you can't take half the kids and lock them in the basement and not give them education. Wait 30 years and see how they do. That's not a reasonable policy in so many ways. So we don't have randomized controlled trials for major public policy decisions, education, welfare, Medicaid, lots of questions we kind of have to guess. But in Oregon, there was this unprecedented opportunity to figure out what the program does at exactly the moment that we're considering expansion in lots of states with a real control group. And this is a collaborative effort. I'm going to tell you a lot about the results, but I don't want to let this opportunity go by without saying how important the cooperation of the state policymakers in Oregon was. 
we funded the study, the researchers, with lots of grants from both nonprofit foundations and the National Institutes of Health. So it didn't cost the state any money to do the evaluation, but they had to facilitate it. They had to give us access to the necessary data sources. They had to keep us in the loop about what was going on. And that's a pain. You guys have a lot of things that you're working on and communicating with researchers is understandably pretty low on your priority list sometimes. And being able to keep those communication channels flowing was essential to generating this information. And I like to think that what we've produced is incredibly helpful for policymaking in Oregon and elsewhere. And it was worth the investment of the state policymakers in helping us facilitate the study. But I can't pretend that that wasn't a really important and time consuming investment for them. So we're really grateful for that. And I hope that you all are too. It was a very expensive study to field. My co-principal investigator on this study is Amy Finkelstein, who's at MIT. And we were talking, having both seen some information about the lottery. Amy read a newspaper story. I'd seen something on, heard something on the radio. And we're like, do you think it was really a lottery? Like, was it really random? Really, really random? We should get a grant or something to study that. Yes, a grant. Ooh, and we should get blood samples. Yes, blood samples. Then we kind of looked at each other like, how do you get blood samples? <laughs> this was a real learning experience and we needed not only lots of money, but expertise from people like the National Center for Health Statistics that helped us design our protocols. And I think we produced some really high quality data, but it was a, a fraught endeavor. So you'll be very glad to know that your taxpayer dollars were hard at work in funding our shovel ready proposal. So with that background, what's the study? The Oregon Health Insurance Experiment is generated by this strange set of circumstances in Oregon where they've got their categorical Medicaid program for people who are disabled, kids, pregnant women, people who are automatically eligible for Medicaid, but then they had an expansion program for anyone below 100% of the federal poverty level who wasn't eligible for another program. So this was their optional population. They had a waiver. It was called Oregon Health Plan Standard. They ran out of money for new enrollment in 2004. So the program continued to exist, but it didn't enroll any new people. Until in 2008, they had enough money to enroll 10,000 more people. That was both because there had been attrition in the program over the intervening four years, but also because they had a new dedicated revenue stream from a provider tax that was earmarked for covering some of the uninsured's costs. So they had enough money to insure 10,000 more people. They correctly surmised that many more than 10,000 people might want the insurance product. So they decided that the only fair thing to do would be to have a lottery. And they did really broad, aggressive outreach and got 90,000 people to sign up for this reservation list in less than six weeks. And then they drew names by chance. Literally, a lottery randomly chose people from this group. And they thought that was most fair because if they had done first come, first serve, then people who were most connected to the social safety net, who had the internet, who were more educated, might have been more likely to sign up. And they wanted to make sure that everybody had an equal chance. So this was developed in co con consultation with stakeholders to, to do what they thought would be best for their population. A byproduct of that, not the intended product, was that it formed the perfect set of circumstances to do such a randomized controlled evaluation because the people whose name were drawn in the lottery look exactly the same as the people whose names were not drawn except by this random luck of the draw. So that's our treatment group, the people whose names were drawn, versus our control group, the people whose names were not drawn. And that's the whole basis of the study. We can then from that tell you what Oregon's Medicaid program did. Now I should be specific, that's Oregon's Medicaid program from 2008 to 2010. Oregon has since changed its Medicaid program, moving towards coordinated care organizations. This was a more traditional Medicaid managed care plan. It covered inpatient, outpatient drugs with no co-pays. It did not cover dental or vision. It paid providers somewhere in the middle of the pack for the generosity of typical state's Medicaid programs. So as you know even better than I, every state's Medicaid program is different and there are features of Oregon's that look different from Kansas or any other state. But in most regards, it looked typical of lots of states' Medicaid programs, especially during that period. And we'll be able to tell you what expanding that Medicaid program to adults who are not disabled, below 100% of the poverty level, 19 to 64. That's the study setup. 
This population is clearly of keen policy interest. It looks a lot like the population that's going to be covered under states that expand under the ACA. ACA goes up to 138% of poverty. This is only 100% of poverty. In lots of other ways, it's the target population, but there's some caveats, some reasons that you should be cautious in generalizing the results that I'm about to show you to nationwide effects or what would happen in Kansas or any other state. And I wanna start with those caveats before I get to the punchline, because you know, you'll get so excited about the punchline, you won't give me a chance to tell you the caveats. And they're important. First, Oregon's population looks a lot like the rest of the US in some regards. Educational attainment looks similar. The healthcare system looks kind of similar in terms of how many safety net providers there are, uncompensated care, share of the population that's on Medicaid. A lot of that looks representative of the rest of the US, but Oregon has a much larger white population than the rest of the US. There is a, a much smaller share of the population that's black, a less than representative share that's Hispanic, so it would be very difficult to infer from Oregon what would happen to racial and ethnic differences in healthcare use, for example. That's just a limitation of the setting. Even more important to generalization, I think, is that we looked at 10,000 new people getting insured. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of covered lives. It's a lot of data, as I'm going to make the case. But it's small relative to the population of Oregon, even relative to the uninsured population of Oregon. So you might think that there would be system level effects of suddenly insuring millions of people that you wouldn't see when you only insure 10,000 people. For example, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see provider shortages in Oregon when you only insure 10,000 people. We also wouldn't expect to see the whole healthcare system adapt to suddenly having to cover people with complicated chronic conditions and low income. There wasn't likely to be any system level change from just insuring 10,000 people. So that's a limitation to what you might expect to see if you suddenly insure a big share of the population. Also, the results that I'm gonna show you look out over two years. Effects over a longer period might be different. So that's a, a question for ongoing research, but I think the first two years give you a pretty good sense of the not immediate short term. Two years is a pretty long time, both in budget cycles and in people's lives. So that's the information that I'm gonna be able to give you today. I'm gonna talk about two different types of outcomes. I'm an economist, so costs and benefits. The costs are primarily increased healthcare use. Now that may be not intuitive to people who don't you know, spend all of their time thinking about costs and benefits in these terms, because a lot of people think, well, the point of health insurance is to expand healthcare use, right? So why are you calling that a cost instead of a benefit? But really, nobody wants healthcare. People want health. The goal isn't, to get an MRI. Do you have time after lunch? The goal <laughs> is to have your back stop hurting or your headache go away. Your goal isn't to take drugs for cancer. Your goal is to survive cancer. So we think of the resource use, the healthcare used as the cost. If you can achieve the same health outcomes using fewer resources, that's a great thing. So you want to keep healthcare use as low as possible for every health outcome that you can achieve. You want to get the most bang for the buck. So, Healthcare utilization is one of the costs. It's not clear ahead of time how you would expect healthcare use to change when people get insurance. You might think, well, suddenly healthcare is more affordable. The price just went down. You may have only taken one economics class, but I bet they taught you that demand sloped down. So you would expect people to use more healthcare when the price to them goes down. On the other hand, uh, a lot of people made the case that people on Medicaid don't get all that much access to care. It doesn't pay providers all that much, so maybe people don't get to see more providers. The uninsured, maybe they're already getting a lot of uncompensated care from clinics, from unpaid bills, from charity care, so maybe there's not such a big difference in healthcare use. So this is a question that we will have to examine with the data, and that makes the most interesting set of research questions is things you don't know the answer to until you actually look. Some people also thought, well, maybe if people get so much healthier when they get Medicaid, maybe if they get out of the emergency department and go to the doctor's office instead, you'll actually save money. I don't think that we had the data to answer that question until this study. So, so this is clearly, I think, an informative set of results. To balance against any change in the costs are changes in benefits. And I'm gonna talk about two different types of benefits. One I think is underappreciated in the debate about what expanding health insurance is likely to do, and that's the financial consequences for enrollees. People forget in the discussion of health insurance that insurance is about protection against financial risk. Getting health insurance isn't just supposed to get you access to health care. It's supposed to keep 
expensive health insurance, health care bills from ruining you financially. It's supposed to keep you from getting evicted from your apartment because you had a hospital bill that you had to pay instead. Now again, with Medicaid, it's not so clear how big those effects might be. If the uninsured are not paying for a lot of their care, then getting insured wouldn't offer them much financial protection. If, on the un other hand, the uninsured are paying a lot for their care, then this could be a serious benefit for getting insurance. So we're going to look at that empirically. But the real punchline, the thing that I think everybody had the, the most hope for in expanding health insurance and the most concern about, if you don't think it's working all that well, is what happens to health after an expansion. How does people, people's physical and mental health change? once they get access to insurance. And we're going to look at that in a, a range of different types of outcome and using a lot of different data. So speaking of data, we had this cooperation from the state that gave us access to the lottery list, who got drawn, who actually got insured. We also had a lot of different sources for outcome data. And I think that's really important if you think that Medicaid may have multifaceted effects. Asking just one question would paint an incomplete picture. So we got as much data as we possibly could. And boy, do we love data sets. We got a lot of different data sets. On the administrative data set side, stuff that was already being collected, we got hospital use. So we have hospital discharges, all the diagnoses and procedures, everything that happened to you once you got into the hospital. Now, as I learned, I didn't know before, but I'm sure all of you did, that if you go to the emergency department, but you don't end up overnight in the hospital, you're not admitted to the hospital. So you don't show up in the hospital's data, even though the emergency department is physically located within the hospital. So we also got emergency department utilization, which would capture not only people who go to the emergency department and get admitted, but people who go to the emergency department and then get sent home without staying overnight in the hospital. We got credit reports so that we could see how having insurance affected people's debts paid, bankruptcies, liens on their homes, things like that, which I think is not so often looked at in the context of health insurance. And we got mortality records. Fortunately, mortality is pretty low in this prime age population, so we didn't see any effects there. That data is great. We have it for everybody on the lottery list or everybody in the Portland area, but it doesn't tell you everything you might want to know. There are a lot of things you just have to ask people about. So we asked people in mail surveys and in in-person surveys about their health care use, their health, how they felt, use of informal credit, borrowing money, interactions with the health care system, demographics we didn't otherwise have. For the mail survey, we were kind of limited in the number of questions we could ask. But for these in-person interviews, we went to about 13,000 people in the greater Portland area and got much richer detail on their health and health care use and also collected physical measures. And that's really important because people are not so able to tell you things like what their cholesterol level is or what their blood pressure is today. Even more so, if people have been to the doctor, they may know more about their health conditions than people who haven't been to the doctor. So if you want to know the effect of insurance on blood pressure and you ask people, do you have high blood pressure? People with insurance, if they were more likely to go to the doctor, might be more likely to know that they have high blood pressure. So if you just say, do you have high blood pressure, the uninsured might be more likely to say yes because they know about it and the uninsured would say, no, not that I know of. And you'd think that insurance raises blood pressure. I hope I got all of those <laughs> words right. You want to capture people's actual blood pressure, not just their knowledge of their blood pressure. So we both asked people about these things and measured them directly. We measured their blood pressure, their cholesterol, their diabetic blood sugar control, obesity. So we have a lot of physical measures as well as a clinical screen for depression, which is much more accurate than just asking people. So we have a lot of information on people, especially in the greater Portland metro area. Data collection is always a challenge. This, the, the driver's fine, so it's okay to chuckle at this picture. This is a truck that was carrying a batch of our blood samples, <laughs> where I, I'm a nervous person to begin with. And then you get phone calls like, yeah, we don't have your blood samples. <laughs> what do you mean you don't have the blood samples? And FedEx sent us this truck, this picture of this truck, that had caught on fire. Um, but the blood samples were fine. So <laughs> no data was harmed in this tragic fire. And, and in the end, we had great data, I think, on people's. And, and this picture, I should tell you, those are our actual little blood spots in that lower right-hand corner. And that's a sad little finger of one of our surveyors because we did a lot of practicing on each other before we were able to go take blood spots from patients. So it was an adventure, but I think we were able to bring to bear the kind of clinical measures that you almost never see in surveys of people. It's, 
it's hard to go get blood spots, but we, we got some great data. So with that wind up, now I will get to the actual answers. What happened to healthcare utilization? Well, we saw an increase in a lot of different kinds of care. We saw increases in outpatient care, going to the doctor's office. There were about 50% more doctor's office visits for people who had insurance relative to the control group. People used more prescription drugs. They were much more likely to get preventive care. Uh, colonoscopies, mammograms, PSA testing, cholesterol checking, all the kinds of care that I think people who were in favor of expansions had hoped for. We also saw more use of hospitals. People were 30% more likely to be hospitalized in the group that got Medicaid relative to the control group. And that, I think, was maybe less expected. The increase in hospitalizations was hospitalizations not originating in the emergency department, but rather hospitalizations that came through a doctor referral or through another channel. So it looks like maybe you go to the doctor and the doctor says you ought to go to the hospital and then you go to the hospital once you're insured. We also saw, and this was just released in early January, so you may have heard a little bit about this, a big increase in emergency department use. There were about 40% more emergency department visits among those who gained access to Medicaid than the control group. And the increase was concentrated in the more discretionary types of visits, by which I mean, you know, think not about somebody who was hit by a bus and taken to the emergency department. That stayed relatively stable. Rather, think about somebody sitting at home with a sprained ankle that might be broken or a cough that hasn't gone away. And they're not sure whether they need to go to the emergency department or not. And whether or not they have insurance is a major determinant of whether they do or not. I think this is an opportunity when we were discussing this more broadly to dispel a popular misperception that just because emergency departments can't turn away people who are uninsured if they need critical care, that means that those people are getting care for free. They're not necessarily getting care for free, they're getting a big bill. And either they're struggling to pay the bill or they're not paying the bill and that is a black mark on their credit. So when we talked to people about their use of different kinds of care, they reported being very concerned about the cost of going to the emergency department and that being a major deterrent when they were uninsured. So I think this dispels the myth that expanding health insurance will increase health care, I'm sorry, that expanding insurance will save money by decreasing utilization, by getting people out of the emergency department and into the doctor's office. That's simply not what we saw. We saw increases across the board. So that tells you their real cost to expanding Medicaid, but what about the benefits? Well, I just mentioned that people were worried about big bills in maybe avoiding going to the emergency department when they were uninsured. And in fact, we find that when you expand insurance, people are much more financially secure. It reduces financial strain in a number of different ways. People are 25% less likely to have an unpaid medical bill sent to collection, for example. That's a serious consequence for people. If you have a bill sent to collection and it's a black mark on your credit, that's not just about getting a mortgage. That's also potentially a negative in trying to get a job or in trying to get an apartment. Lots of people check your credit report. And so having a better credit report forecasts much better outcomes across a range of type of outcomes. It's also not good news for the healthcare system when an unpaid bill is sent to collection. Just because it's sent to collection does not mean it is collected upon. In fact, less than 2% of the bills that are sent to collection result in a payment. So this is care that providers were delivering for which they were not being paid. And we see a big reduction in that. We see a virtual elimination of catastrophic out-of-pocket medical expenses, defined as having to pay more than 30% of your income for health care out-of-pocket. That is eliminated once people get insurance. They're much less likely to have to borrow or skip paying other bills because of their medical bills. So they are clearly much more secure financially. What about the health outcomes? Well, there we have more of a mixed bag. Self-reported health improves substantially. People are much more likely to report that their health is good, very good, or excellent instead of fair or poor. They're much less likely to say their health has been declining. They report fewer days missed of their usual activities, lower self-reports of depression. So that all suggests that people are feeling much better. But when we look at the clinical results that we got from those in-person interviews, it's a much more mixed picture. The depression result remains. There's a 30% drop in the prevalence of depression, which is a really big improvement for a serious mental health burden, health burden faced by this population. 
but we do not detect any improvements in blood pressure, diabetic blood sugar control, or cholesterol. Now, this was surprising to many people who advocated expanding insurance for the sake of improving these chronic conditions. Why didn't we see anything? You might say, well, maybe you didn't wait long enough. Maybe two years isn't long enough. We chose these conditions because they are prevalent enough to observe effects and because there are treatments available that if taken in concordance with the clinical literature would produce improvements that we could measure within six months let alone two years so if you have high blood pressure and you're prescribed a medication and you're taking it regularly as directed the clinical literature says we should see an improvement if we don't see it in two years the odds that we see it in three years seem relatively low to me although our study can only speak directly to the first two years maybe uh, people weren't prescribed these medications and or stopped taking them along the way. That we can't observe. We only see whether people are taking the medications at the point that we're observing. We do see an increase in diagnosis and treatment of diabetes, but not for the other conditions. Maybe our sample's not big enough. Well, we did a lot of things to try to increase the power of the study. And the bigger your sample is, the smaller the effect you're able to find. Whereas if you only have a few people, it takes a really big effect to show up statistically. We had 13,000 people, so this is not a small study. But we also looked at the subsets of people where you might be most likely to see effects. For example, we looked at the older part of our population from 50 to 64. We looked at people who'd been diagnosed with high blood pressure before the lottery, where there's potentially the biggest scope for improvement. We put all the measures together into something called the Framingham Risk Score that combines all of these into one measure of cardiovascular risk. In none of those cases did we see statistically significant improvements. So I think that there's little evidence that Medicaid made much of a difference in these particular physical conditions. But interpreting what we know for sure versus what we don't is really important. And I cannot say that there was no effect. I can only say that the effect was small enough that whatever it was, it's not observable over a two-year window with 13,000 people. Doesn't mean it's absolutely zero. So what do you say, how do I read all of that evidence put together? Well, I said before that I thought that we could dispel the myth that expanding Medicaid saves money. I think we can also dispel the myth that expanding Medicaid does not help beneficiaries. Some people posited that it's such a terrible program that it has these huge costs, but people don't get access to care, their health doesn't improve at all, their lives aren't any better, it's a waste of money we shouldn't expand. I don't think that's true. I think beneficiaries are demonstrably better off. They're more financially secure, their mental health is improved, their self-reported health is better, they report much higher well-being overall. But we can dispel the myth that that improvement in beneficiary well-being in any way saves money. It costs money. People use more health care. Some people said, well, OK, maybe people aren't getting out of the emergency department, but they're getting healthier enough that we'll see an increase in labor force participation. We don't see any change in employment or any change in earnings. So I think it paints a much more nuanced picture that there are real costs to taxpayers, although who pays those costs depends on if it's federal dollars or state dollars, but there are real costs to taxpayers of expanding Medicaid, and there are real benefits to beneficiaries of being covered, and policymakers have to weigh those against each other. So what was the reaction to this evidence? We're all excited, we're academic researchers, look, we have data for you! And people said, well, I kind of knew what Medicaid does, and your study proves it. And these headlines are all about the same paper. And you can see that they are wildly divergent. Some say that we just proved that Medicaid is good. Some say that we just proved that Medicaid is bad. My personal favorite is the one in the middle. How to use the Oregon Medicaid study to your ideological advantage. I was like, OK, that's at least honest. Thank you. <laughs> so you see headlines like this. You might be a little disheartened as you, know, you think of yourself as a scientist and you like to think that you've brought some evidence to bear that will be useful to people in making better informed decisions, and this is what you get. On the other hand, I do think that we contributed in some small way to changing the debate a little bit. I think people stopped saying quite as loudly, being on Medicaid is worse than being uninsured. And st because I don't think that's true, and started asking the question, is there a more effective way to insure people? Would catastrophic insurance be better? Would private plans be better? Can we do better than Medicaid is doing in improving people's health? People also stopped saying quite as much that Medicaid was free and started thinking about whether it was worth the money and who was paying that money 
to achieve the benefits for beneficiaries. So I like to think that this study and, and others like it were a force in the direction of evidence-based policy, but you all will be much better judges of that than I am, and I would love to answer any questions that you might have about the particulars of the study or any of the evidence that I've talked about today. Uh, if people have questions, please feel free to go up to one of the mics and just tell us your name and the organization. And for people who are listening online, if you just type your question in the uh, comment section and your name and organization, then we'll try to get that question read to the group as well. Representative Croft. I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for being here. This is very interesting. I, didn't, I was kind of the one who was uh, trying to figure out if the Oregon study proved anything. I've been reading different commentary on the Oregon studies. So this has been very helpful. But I sent you the term of that uh, outcomes of high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, cholesterol weren't necessarily improved. I'm curious. Uh, if you found any difference in hospitalization rates between people in the study group versus people in the control group? Yes, yeah, so, so that's, that's a, a great question. question. And we, we did, did look at hospitalization, hospitalization rates, rates, and I, I sort of glossed over those results. We found about a 30% increase in the probability of being hospitalized if you were on Medicaid relative to the control group. That's an increase from about six percentage points of the control group over about a 15 month period to eight percentage points of the treatment group or the, right, the group covered by Medicaid. So we see an increase in the use of hospitals along with increases in doctor's office visits and prescription drugs. And this, you know, I, I think this suggests you know, going back to demand slopes down, it turns out that when you make all of this care free, people use more across the boards. Hi, I'm, oh. No, <laughs> see, these mics are tricky. I'm Dave Wilson with ARP Kansas. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a really unfair question, maybe. I will feel free to avoid answering. <laughs> <laughs> what you know about Kansas? What is your advice for Kansas? Do you think we should expand Medicaid in Kansas, and why, or why not? So I will answer towards your question, but not exactly answer, because it's not my um, prerogative to say what policymakers should do. There's a reason no one elects economists. And I, I think what I can do is tell you what I see as the costs and benefits. What I can't do is tell you, as a policy community, how you value those benefits and what your alternative use of the money is for the cost. So it seems clear to me that beneficiaries are better off with Medicaid and that not expanding hurts the people who would get Medicaid if you expanded. Those people are clearly worse off. Now, the question of whether that is worth spending the money on is what else you could do with the money. They're real costs. People who are on Medicaid consume about 25 to 35% more health care, and the program is responsible not just for the increase in the health care they consume, but for all of their health care consumption. So those dollars could go to some other program, education, highways, lowering taxes, something else. In this particular instance, those aren't dollars that are under Kansas's control. Those are federal dollars, not entirely, but mostly. So you don't get to take those dollars and reprogram them towards something else in Kansas. And that's something to, for policymakers to weigh who's bearing the cost of the program and what's the benefit to beneficiaries of getting it. Now, that doesn't tell you the answer to whether you should or not, because should is about your policy values, what you think, you know, if you want to participate in a program or not is not just about the economics. It's about lots of other things. And that's why I think that it would be overstepping for me to say, therefore, you should or shouldn't expand. But I think it seems clear that the benefits to beneficiaries are real and that it comes with a dollar cost to someone. In this case, mostly federal dollars. But in the long run, who knows what the mix is. Uh, add one piece to that question, which is uh, there's been a lot made about. Man, I just got out of that question. 
the, the concept of states that are not participating in Medicaid, somehow uh, their federal tax dollar is going to support Medicaid expansion in other states. Could you just address that set of issues? I mean, fundamentally, the federal dollars are collected from residents of all the states, and they're going back out disproportionately to the states that are expanding the program. So that involves redistribution between states. The donor states in this instance are the ones who are paying but not expanding, and the recipient states are the ones who are getting more in Medicaid benefits than their citizens put in. And differential expansion changes the, the, the FISC, the, the Federalist redistribution, and that's something to consider. Uh, could you speak to a little bit of, you, you said that you, you didn't exactly see improvements in, in some of the areas people were just accessing more. And when I think about diabetes and I think about health care, what I, I kind of didn't hear, and I don't know if your study uh, looked at this at all, but the educational part about prevention, you know, if, if people just understood maybe how to eat a little bit better, do a little exercise, I know that that decreases uh, those things. And so my, my point of the question is, though, you talked about how uh, governments have to decide how to prioritize that money. To me, that might be an area to take a look at. No, I think that's a great question, and one might hope that over a longer window of time, people would get better educated about how to use the resources on hand to better manage chronic conditions. It's also worth noting that in the period since we've done our study, Oregon has moved towards coordinated care organizations, partly in an attempt to do better disease management of this population, and that was before, after our study, data were collected, but before our results were available. So they were already moving in that direction before seeing these results. So that suggests that this is consistent with what they were seeing on the ground. We collected a lot of data that we have yet to analyze. We, you know, it's a treasure trove. We've been spinning as fast as we can and analyzing it. And these are sort of the first top line results. But one of the things that we also collected data on is the built environment, the availability of fresh and affordable foods, the density of fast food restaurants, the walkability of neighborhoods, uh, access to parks, public transit lines, crime and local economic deprivation. And we're going to combine that information to see how these effects might differ based on whether you actually have a supermarket in your neighborhood or not. And, that, and those social determinants of health may be just as important as access to care. Representative Don Heinemann, a uh, question about the rather sur surprising result that uh, ER visits did not go down for new enrollees. And I think that relates to the fact that this is a population that wasn't used to accessing health care in a different way. Um, and it seems to me there's an opportunity there for attitude or behavior adjustment by uh, uh, the use of market signals and, and primarily increasing the copay where you get their attention and they access health care more appropriately. Would that be true? I think you're raising a really good point that the copays are zero for this population for both the emergency department and doctor's offices and the fact that we see the biggest increase in can care for conditions that could be treatable in a doctor's office that are not emergent that are potentially preventable this suggests that if you could move people to a different site of care you could deliver care more efficiently and other studies have shown that patients are sensitive to copays and there's a, a growing movement in both medicare and medicaid and on the commercial side to have co-payments that give better signals to patients about the appropriate site of care and you can imagine a system that's not what we study here but you can imagine a system where there was a 50 dollars copay for the emergency department and no copay for preventive care at your doctor's office and that would affect behavior differently than a system that had no copays for any of these things i do want to note though that we saw at least as big an increase in doctor's office visits as we saw in emergency department visits so it's not that people couldn't find a doctor to see them, didn't go to the doctor at all, only went to the emergency department, both went up. And so this suggests that there's an opportunity to move people from one site of care to another, and that seems like a really fruitful avenue to explore to me. Okay, thank you. And second question, if I might, uh, regarding the, the lack of, of uh, change in outcome uh, regarding uh, blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, did you do follow up and examine 
actual uh, taking of the medication, not, not just in interviews, but checking uh, how frequently they got the script refilled. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a piece of information that I would love to have that was simply not available to us. I wish there were an administrative data source that had not, you know, taking medications would be the best measure to have, but even regular medication possession, you know, if we could look at people's refills every month to see if people are actually getting the prescriptions in the first place and then getting them refilled. I think that would be incredibly valuable. We don't have such data, and that's in part because of a universal data shortcoming. You know, lots of states have all payer, all claims databases. And I was like, all pay or all claims. That's everything, right? But it turns out it's not self-pay. So we don't have data on the control groups, refills. We can tell you about what happened with the people who had Medicaid, but then we have nothing to compare them to. There's no evidence about how that differs if you have insurance versus not, because we don't have data on refills for the control group. We have one point in time where we cataloged everybody's medications. And that tells us a point in time, what are the what is the chance that you have a blood pressure medication today if you're insured versus if you're in the control group? That doesn't tell us if you ever had a prescription and stopped refilling it, if you're taking the prescription that you have. That's just not data that we have, and I wish that we did because I think there's ample evidence that adherence to all sorts of medications is wildly imperfect, not just for people on Medicaid or uninsured, but commercially insured, everybody. There's wild lack of adherence, and you know, Again, getting a little bit away from the results of our study, it's amazing to me how imperfect the adherence is to things like anti-organ rejection drugs, where it's like you have a new liver, but you have to take this pill for your body not to reject it, and there's imperfect adherence to that. We clearly have a systemic problem on that. And that's interesting to think about the lack of adherence in juxtaposition to the improvement in depression and the lack of improvement in blood pressure. When you take your depression meds, there's a good chance that you feel better and that you notice that taking the medication has made a difference. When you have high blood pressure, if you take the pill today, if you don't take the pill today, you feel the same. And adherence in general, again, not restricted to this low-income population, is markedly worse for situations where the patient can't observe any difference in symptoms, where it's not salient what adherence does. So, so that suggests the potential for system-level reforms to improve those things. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Catherine, for your presentation. I'm Senator Falsudo, uh, representing the 29th District in the city of Wichita, where two of your major uh, hospitals are, the Wesley Medical Center and Via Christi. Um, my question relates to the high uh, population of constituents that I represent who are both, or who both suffer from being unemployed and uh, who don't have health insurance. And you uh, mentioned in your um, your study of the relationship between uh, debt um, and having health care and not getting that big uh, uh, medical bill. So, did you find in your studies that those who were covered under insurance and not getting that high collection debt bill that it made a difference there as it relates to jobs and health care? Yeah, there was speculation on both sides that uh, increasing insurance, you, you could imagine expanding Medicaid going in both directions for employment. Some people said, well, if you get people healthier and get them access to health care and they don't have these credit report problems and they're not struggling to deal with their depression, that they might be better able to get a job and hold a job so you should see an increase in employment. Other people said, well, wait a minute, Medicaid is means tested. So if your income is too high, you lose your Medicaid eligibility. People may be reluctant to go get a job now that they've finally gotten health insurance. They're worried that if their income is too high, they're going to lose their health insurance benefits, especially if they got a part-time job, an hourly job that doesn't come with benefits. So expanding Medicaid could actually discourage work and reduce employment. So we went to the Social Security record data, where we could get real administrative data on hours worked, whether you worked at all, as well as participation in other programs like SSI, disability insurance, things like that. We didn't see any effect on those. We saw no change in employment, no change, no change in whether you were employed at all, no change in your earnings from employment or your economic self-sufficiency in that way, no change in participation in disability insurance. And I think that that is partly 
um, attributable to the characteristics of our particular population because there have been some other studies that came up with different results for the effect of Medicaid looking higher up the income distribution. Our population was not working a lot to begin with. Less than half were regularly employed and their income is low enough and their health burden is high enough that maybe they just weren't close to the margin of working either way and results might differ particularly higher up the income distribution. You saw some different results in a, a different kind of study setting with a, a less of a control group but still some reasonable attempt at a control group in Tennessee where they took Medicaid away higher up the income distribution and saw that Medicaid was driving, um, so that it actually decreased employment. And so I think that might be a relic of the higher income distribution. I can't say for sure, but all I can say is that here we did not see any employment or earnings effects. Now, follow up on what you were saying. With, we can look at your results, and if I wanted to say it needs to be expanded, I could make my case. If somebody says no, we really should, they could make their case as well. And that you said they re attended more, they, they got more medical care. Could that have been because there were more presenting illnesses by the time they finally got there? That sometimes people don't go on the first one. And they don't go to the second one, they don't go to the third one. When they first, when they go, then they have to go back again because there's so many. But the real question I have is when you did this study, did you have hypotheses in terms of what it was you were looking for? Because you didn't cover that part. So that is a great question, and I'm so glad that you asked it because. Um, so this is like a bullet I totally glossed over on this slide. That is really important to specify your hypotheses ahead of time because it's so easy. There's so many choices you have to make in analyzing data. I presented this as very simple, you know, treatment, control, subtract, you're done. Of course it's not that simple. There are a million choices that you make about how you deal with the data. What counts as an outlier? Can people go to the hospital a thousand times in a year, or do you think that's a typo? How many hysterectomies can you have? You know, like there, there are um, ways that you clean up the data when you know that there are errors in the data. There, you know, functional form, meaning how do you look at the outcome variables? Do you look at what people's blood pressure is continuously, or do you look at a cutoff for hypertension? Or do you look at a cutoff for pre-hypertension? Do you look at, you know, there's so many choices you make that it's really easy for researchers with the best of intentions to cherry pick results or to move in a direction that's consistent with what they find. And I think the instances of genuine fraud and manipulation are really small. What I think happens much more often is human nature, that if you see something that's really surprising, you think, is there a mistake in the data? I better look more closely. Whereas if you see something that lines up with what you were expecting, you're like, okay, there's the answer. And it's human nature to poke more at some results than at other results. We knew this was a really rare opportunity. And so we, we knew it was imperative upon us as we spent years of our lives and millions of dollars of other people's money that we do this with the highest scientific standards. So what we did is we wrote down not only all the hypotheses that we were gonna test, but exactly how we were going to analyze the data, how we were going to clean the data, what regressions we were going to run. We made all the tables that you see in all the papers that have been published so far, but empty to say, here's exactly what we're going to show you. And then we publicly archived that analysis plan, meaning before we looked at the data, we said, here's exactly what we're going to do with the data. And we put that up on a public website with a date stamp. So you can still go look at those. And they're incredibly detailed, 100 page long documents saying exactly what we were going to do. And then that's exactly what we did. So I think we have inoculated ourselves against that kind of inadvertent data manipulation or data mining. Now sometimes the challenge with that is maybe you see some results and it raises a question that you hadn't thought of before where you say, oh, now that I see this, I wish we'd also run that regression. We still did that, but we marked those very clearly as saying this particular idea occurred to us after we saw the results. So it's not part of our analysis plan. You can take it with a grain of salt if you so choose. And I think that that really preserved the integrity of the data analysis and is something that we took very seriously that is not so interesting to the non-research community, but I'm really glad that you gave me a chance to say it. <laughs> Thank you for being here. My name is John Wilson. I represent the 10th House District in Baltimore City. 
And I'm um, not quite sure how to format my question, but the talk of prevention and whether or not people stick to healthy habits in the first place uh, affects us. But I, I think of somebody like my dad who has private health insurance, obese, um, has high blood pressure, is diabetic, but has great health insurance. And I wonder, is there a way to compare the results we're seeing from Medicaid to private health insurance? And are the habits generally similar? And is it really getting back to policy that focuses on prevention? Yeah, no, that's a really important point and one that unfortunately I can't answer from our study. We were handed this experiment because of the policy circumstances in Oregon where we could compare Oregon's Medicaid program to being uninsured. And I think we've got great information on that. It does not tell you anything about what would happen if you covered people with a different kind of insurance program, private insurance. We can't compare private insurance to Medicaid. We can't compare private insurance to being uninsured. We just don't have the data set up to do that. And we worked pretty hard to not overstep and extrapolate beyond what the data really support. That said, I think there's lots of evidence from other studies that's not as definitive as the randomized controlled trial gold standard, but it really suggested, going back to the adherence question that was raised before, that a lot of the problems you see in disease management for patients enrolled in Medicaid, you also see for patients enrolled in Medicare and patients enrolled in commercial insurance. And I think it's safe to say, not from our study, but from the body of evidence, that we are not, as a healthcare system, doing nearly as good a job as we could in managing chronic conditions and preventing really expensive downstream sequelae of these conditions. So I, I would love to see better disease management in all sorts of insurance programs. And one step in that direction goes back to the potential co-pays for emergency department visits. Value-based insurance design is something that's kicking around on both the commercial side and the Medicare side, where you could think maybe patients should have co-pays that vary based on the value of the care. Maybe for diabetic patients, they should have no co-pay for cholesterol-lowering drugs, whereas for people with much lower cardiovascular risk, they should have a $10 co-pay for cholesterol-lowering drugs. That kind of thinking might focus prevention, primary and secondary prevention efforts on patients where it's going to do the most good in improving their health and in slowing the growth of healthcare spending. And that kind of experimentation with insurance design, I think, has to be part of the solution to what is clearly a wide-ranging problem. I have one more question. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Finney, and I'm a state resident from the 84th District of Wichita. And you kind of hit on my question. I was going to ask you about chronic conditions and if they help improve with your study. But I, I know that before you said you couldn't answer whether or not we should expand Medicaid in Kansas. But I want to put it to you directly. Do you think that expansion of Medicaid from the studies that you've seen has to actually saved lives? From our study, I can say that expanding Medicaid improves well-being. How that translates into mortality is not something that this study can really say, unfortunately, because, I mean, I guess it's actually fortunate the death rate is relatively low. I have to remind myself, lower death rates, good. Um, so because mortality in this 19 to 64 year old population is relatively low, we just can't translate anything that we're seeing into a measurable change in mortality. So I can't go so far as to say saving lives from this study. There's some other studies that show reductions in mortality with Medicaid. They don't have the same design. I don't want to speak to those other studies. But I can say that it improves people's well-being along dimensions that other studies have correlated to longer run health consequences, including mortality. So self-reported health improves substantially. Depression reduced substantially. Those things have serious downstream health consequences. So I feel completely confident in saying that people are much better off, that it's improved their well-being and it's improved their health. But I can't say from this study, save lives. We do have one question from the uh, web audience that Scott will give us briefly. Now, this is from Brett Ellis. He says, in terms of off offsets, he spoke of the effective decrease in bills that go to collections and go unpaid, therefore lowering uncompensated care. Was there any consideration from an economic perspective given to the private practice of it, to the practice of adjusting private market rates to account for uncompensated care and the effective disproportionate share hospital payments to bank? 
So that, that's a really important set of questions. Our study doesn't speak to that directly. We don't observe any payments, per se, in our study. We observe utilization, and we translate that to the dollars associated with those things. But all we observe is, did you go to the hospital or not? How, much, how many resources were used there? Did you go to the emergency department or not? Did you report going to the doctor's office or not? The question of cost shifting is more controversial among industrial organization researchers and economists than you might think. I hear a lot from the healthcare community about cost shifting. We hear a lot about that at MedPAC, about how Medicare's payment rates affect Medicaid payment rates or commercial rates or whether or not we should adjust to that and the cost shifting that providers do. So there's clearly a widespread perception that cost shifting, meaning changing the prices that you're charging to one population because of the prices you're charging or not able to collect from another population, it's more difficult to tell a persuasive story in the economic evidence or the theory that such cost shifting should exist or does exist. Theory would suggest, and data seems to support the idea, that if you could charge your private insurers more, you would do so, regardless of whether you had uncompensated care or not. That, you know, providers charge as much as they can, as much as the market will bear, and this isn't bad behavior, this is normal pricing behavior, and it's much harder to tell a story where because somebody else paid you less for something, you're then able to extract more money from this guy over here. You hear enough of it from providers that you have to wonder if the models and the data are missing something. And the story may be very different in non-competitive markets. So you may think that it's very different when there's a dominant provider group or a dominant insurer, and their negotiating clout may be affected by the presence of dish payments, either Medicare or Medicaid dish payments, in the presence of uncompensated care pools. So it's, I think the jury is still out on the degree to which there is cost shifting. That is not something that we studied in. That's a sad note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much.